I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective. I really love family photographs, all of them. From the mystery images you find in shoeboxes and albums, to the pictures you snap with your digital devices, no mystery is too small. A simple question about an image can lead to new stories of your ancestors. This means you can count on me to help you identify the people in them, offer solutions for preserving and organizing them, and yes, even guide you in the various ways to gather and share picture stories with your relatives. Welcome to The Photo Detective, where we cover historical image analysis, genealogy, and how to work with your family photo collection. If you've ever seen a piece of jewelry with hair in it, you've probably wondered, what's that about? While we associate hair jewelry with mourning, that's not the whole story. It's complicated. My guest, Sarah Nahama, shared fascinating facts about mourning and memorial jewelry. One piece with her first name on it inspired her to start collecting these antiques. As a jewelry designer, these historical pieces influence the work she creates today. I hope you'll be able to join me for my virtual masterclass, Dead or Alive, Morning Memorials, Spirit Photographs, and the Undead, on October 24th. There are a limited number of spots, so secure your ticket at MaureenTaylor.com. Don't worry if you can't watch it live. You'll have some time to be able to view it later. Sarah Nahama has a degree in art history from Boston University and has been designing and creating one-of-a-kind precious metals jewelry for over 25 years. Her studio is in the Providence, Rhode Island area. Sarah has also been collecting antique mourning and sentimental jewelry since 2005. She co-curated an exhibit in Boston, Massachusetts of mourning jewelry and art, and authored a book on the subject, In Death Lamented, the Tradition of Anglo-American Mourning Jewelry. Sarah, thank you so much for being on The Photo Detective. Thank you, Maureen, for having me. I am fascinated with what you do. So you are both a jewelry designer and a collector of mourning jewelry and memorial pieces, correct? Correct. Yes. And a mutual friend or colleague introduced us, a Greg French of Greg French Photography. Um, a dealer in historic images. And it turns Mm -hmm. out that you live not that far from me, which was very exciting. So we actually had lunch once and we're going to do it again. But yay, (laughs) yay! I know we had a lot to talk about. But in the course of setting up this interview, you mentioned to me that you have a book and it's called In Death Lamented, The Tradition of Anglo-American Mourning Jewelry, which I... I somehow did not know about, but now I have it and it is gorgeous. So can you tell me a little bit about, well, first off, what came first, the collecting or the jewelry making? The jewelry making came first. I, I, um, well, I had gone to university, Boston University, and I got a degree in art history. And then I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with that. I was debating going to graduate school, um, studying art restoration. And then I took a jewelry making class, just a local class in my neighborhood, just for the fun of it. And I loved it so much. And I decided to pursue that. And so I did. Um, And I, so I finished my program, it was a two year program. I finished that in around 1990 and I just started I started working for a jewelry store and doing some repairs but also making my own work and custom work and then I and then I stopped and I started just exclusively focusing on my own designs so that came first the collecting of the morning jewelry did not start until uh, I'd say 2005 at the end I didn't even really know what it was I liked antique jewelry but it was not on my radar and I discovered it really at the end of 2004 and it just took off. And so, but what triggered it? 
Was there a particular piece you saw somewhere and you just had to have it or it was just the mystery of it all and you thought, I need to know more about this? Well, both. It was a particular piece. I was, um, I was actually living in Los Angeles. I was online looking at antique jewelry and I saw a little tiny brooch um, that said, in memory of Sarah. And um, Sarah was spelled out in tiny seed pearls on top of hair. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Who's this Sarah? And what's morning jewelry? And why is there hair in it? So anyway, I loved it. I bought it. And then that sparked my um, quest to find out more about what, what exactly is this. And it just took off from there. So, yes, it was, it was a mystery. And I realized that a lot of people had never heard of it. Um, at least nobody I knew. <laughs> Even people who liked antiques and antique jewelry. Well, there is that little bit of a yuck factor, I think, when people think about having a deceased person's hair and a piece of jewelry. They can be quite lovely, but there is still that that moment. And I and I know this for a fact because I wrote an article once about a little girl's book that she had kept. And this was pre-photography. And so the mm -hmm. only way she had to remember people was to take clippings of their hair and then write a little something about them. So I wrote an article right. about this book. And at the time, my editor was like, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> right. There is, there is that cultural aversion, at least, you know, in our society, contemporary aversion to other people's strangers' hair. I mean, it's okay if it's a relative or if it's your lover or a child, but you're right. There is that. Um, and it's kind of doesn't really make sense because hair in and of itself is not, it's not dirty. And a lot of the hair jewelry that you see, um, in order to work it, say, into a chain or something like that, it has to be boiled. So, but it's, I understand that. I mean, we have that aversion. Um, but you have to remember that people, like you said, this this album that you found in the article you wrote, pre-photography, I think now everybody has images of their friends, their loved ones, their pets on their phones, or at least on paper, you have so many. And people didn't have that. And hair was a way to remember them. I mean, of course, there was miniature portraits as well, but hair was a tangible thing that you could keep for a friend, you know, whether they were dead or not, as a friendship token or as a memorial token. It made them more real. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, today mothers will cut a lock of their child's hair and save it, you know. From and the that's first not, haircut. Yeah, that's not something that unusual. Well, I know my mom has a big braid from my sister from, you know, from her first haircut. She saved it. She still has it. I think I might have a little curl somewhere hidden away right. from one of my children, at least. Uh, mm -hmm. And your, so your book, In Death Lamented, is actually a, a catalog from, for an exhibit that was at the Massachusetts Historical Society in 2012, correct? Well, to a certain degree, it's not a catalog per se because uh, the jewelry that's featured in there is from their collection. Uh, which is quite extensive, and the pieces that I loaned to the exhibit. But we also did borrow from the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem and Historic New England, and both those institutions were very generous. They loaned us a lot of incredible jewelry. Um, and we had a couple of pieces also from the, um, the Quincy, John Quincy, I think it's called the Adams Historical museum it's in quincy mm -hmm. um and we had a piece from them um and so we didn't include those in the book because of photo rights and cost and so forth but um so it's not a complete catalog but it's a companion volume that's what we call it um and it has a lot of information about um the history of morning jewelry as well as the individual pieces that we show 
Well, the pieces are beautiful. They range from rings to lockets. Some pieces have mm -hmm. hair and some pieces do not. It looks like some of them have like mother of pearl. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Enamel. What yeah. is the most unusual piece you've ever seen? Mm. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. That's, there's, you know, it's hard to answer that because there's pieces that are unusual in different ways. For example, with, um, could be with materials or the construction or uh, the engraving, telling a story. I have a, a locket with two portrait miniatures and this extensive lament by the father and husband of the two people that are being mourned. And I mean, it's, it's almost like an essay, but it's so heart wrenching. And I've never seen anything that extensive. Um, and that, you know, and then there's pieces that they're very common for their time period and their type and the materials, you know, the style is not that unusual, but there may be something unusual about it um, in terms of the history of it, or again, the, the um, memorial engraving on it. So when, when we first said, when we first talked about you, you doing this interview, we, we chatted about morning jewelry and you told me something that surprised me that not all mourning jewelry, I think there was a, not all mourning jewelry signifies uh, a death. Is that true? Or was it a memorial piece that you were talking about? That some of them are memorial pieces rather than funeral related pieces? I'm, I'm feeling well, confused about it. I know what you're getting at. Yes, actually, what we had talked about was hair jewelry. And I had said that not all hair jewelry is for mourning that uh, many, many hair uh, jewelry pieces are sentimental or love tokens and have nothing to do with death um, at all. They were just given, like your album, you know, with the little clippings. Um, it was just a record of friendships. Uh, then we, we had also talked about the difference between, I think we did, about Memento Mori, and mourning jewelry or memento mori is um jewelry that will have symbols of death like skull crossbones hourglass grave digger tools but it doesn't memorialize anybody it's just a reminder that death is waiting to live a good life um it, it predates mourning jewelry uh, but mourning jewelry adopted a lot of the iconography of it, especially the earlier pieces. And there are pieces that were souvenirs for funerals. So in the 18th century, that was very common, certainly of, for people of means to leave money in their will to provide for souvenirs. And those could be rings uh, and those could be gloves, scarves. And these were given out to prominent people in the funeral procession. Um, and then it became much more personal where that wasn't done and it was just something commissioned by, by somebody left behind that wanted a memorial. So how well documented are these pieces that you, you now collect? I personally catalog everything I have. So I know, you know, the materials, um, where I bought it, how much I paid for it, and when, and then any information I can find. So what I love is that uh, not all, but many of the pieces have a name and a date of death. And starting from that, on uh, a number of them, I've been able to find out quite a bit of information. We're lucky because a lot of these pieces come from England, and they keep very good church records and you know, if these things are digitized, it's not hard to find something. So, in some pieces, I found some incredible information. Um, so, I document what I buy because it's my collection. Um, 
And also, if I ever go to sell a piece, I want to be able to provide as much information as possible. Yeah, I was wondering about how many pieces came to you with a name on them. And you just verified that you pretty much collect pieces that do have names. But you also... Right. Yeah. I have pieces without names. Like I said, I have, I have um, mid-19th century lockets with a daguerreotype or an amber type, and they don't have any names. They have the image, and they have the hair on the back, sometimes, not always. And they're not necessarily mourning pieces. We don't know because there's no name, no inscription of death. They could have been just, you know, a photo locket of somebody. They could have certainly been appropriated for a mourning piece after the person died. Who knows? We have no way of knowing. But um, but I tend to like um, pieces that do have names and dates of death because, you know, then there's a starting point where I can possibly find out more information. To me, part of the appeal is that it's, you know, it's a window onto a life um, and it's a human being <laughs> that had dreams, that had, um, you know, things that we all go through. They had love, they had an end. And if I can find out information about that, I don't know, there's something, it's, it connects us. It's mm -hmm. a human connection. And that's what I really like about it. And the pieces to me, I mean, they inspire me because of the jewelry work, of course. And I, I love that. And to see how jewelry was made or what materials they use, things that we don't do anymore. But, but really, in the end, it's the human connection that these were people that lived and that had people that cared about them. They were important in some way, whether nationally, like I have a ring for a queen, um, Queen Caroline, who was the wife of George II, um, and she was very well loved by the English people. Um, so, you know, they were important in that way, or just for an infant, a two-month-old child who just had their parents to mourn them. And that in and of itself is poignant and human. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So where do you find these pieces? Uh, just online auction catalogs. I know I've gone to Brimfield, which is the big antique mm -hmm. mart that happens three times a year. And I'm always looking at the jewel, the antique jewelry. I think it's interesting. And I, I look at the hair pieces because they're interesting. But I rarely mm -hmm. see a name on those pieces. So I'm very intrigued with the fact that your collection primarily has names and dates of death on it. Uh, but where mm. where else do you find these these items? I find them all over. When I first started, I was buying a lot on eBay. Um, but I mean, I've met a number of different antique dealers that I work with. I go, you know, I'll, I'll definitely go to auctions, um, private sales. Instagram actually has been quite good for me because there's you know, there's a number of collectors and dealers on there that I can see what they have. And I've bought things and made friends, too, with people that I've purchased from. Um, there's, I'll say this, there's a lot of fakes out there, especially in terms of certain types of mourning jewelry. Things with skulls are huge. There's a huge fake market and some are very obvious. Others, not quite as much. There's a huge fake market for lover's eyes. I don't know if you're familiar with those um, portraits of eyes that were very popular for a short window of time from 1790 to 1820 that were sentimental pieces. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to be careful um, buying like that. But um, yeah, so. I'll, I'll look, I'll always look. I always tell people, you know, if you have stuff, show it to me. I'll always look. I, I love your Instagram feed. Oh, thank you so much. It's uh, something I it's fun. Look, at, look at all the time because it's a mix of both the jewelry, of course, that you've designed, but it's, a, mm -hmm. it's it includes images of the jewelry that you've collected. And so it's, it's very interesting. I always learn something from your feed. And that's great. 
what's your, why don't you tell us how we can find you on Instagram? Well, it's just my name, um, at Sarah Nahama is my Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a link to my website and my website has my own work. It has also, um, links to my book and, um, places I've spoken because I give lectures on morning jewelry. Um, and there's also, uh, events page. So if I'm doing a studio sale, for example, I have one coming up in October, I mean, November in Boston and another talk, I'll, I'll list those. There's a talk I'm doing in Manchester by the sea in November as well. So yeah, you can find that information on my website. Um, or you, you know, you can message me through Instagram. Yeah, I, I mean, I look at your Instagram every day. So. Oh, thank you, Maureen. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> That's <Wonderful>. great. Uh, <laughs> well, so, since we're neighbors, you can also come and see things in person if you like. Well, that would be very exciting. And I know you have a piece that that a friend of ours or a friend of mine, who will soon become a friend of yours, is very interested in seeing because it has mm -hmm. a connection to the Franklin family. Correct. What? I can tell you about a little bit about that if you like. Sure. Well, I bought that. Now that's going back because I bought that probably around 2005, 2006. And I did buy it on eBay from an English dealer. Um, it's a gold locket with two sides. One side has a, a um, photograph of a young girl, not, not a child, but like a teenager. And the other side has two colors of hair woven together. And then around the bezel, in, in the gold bezel, um, it, it has her name, Clara Elizabeth Wilkinson, and her date of birth, which was um, 1851, and her date of death, which was 1867. So she was, she was young, you know, 16 when she died. And I just loved, first of all, I love her photo. She has this little smile and this little, it's kind of faded, but little mischievous look in her eyes, I think. And um, so I bought it. And um, right around that time, I was moving from Los Angeles to Boston. So I was wearing it one day. I went to visit a friend at her office. And her office overlooked the old granary burial ground in Boston, which, as you probably know, is one of the oldest uh, graveyards in Boston. Um, and most prominent in that cemetery is a big obelisk that says Franklin on it. And a lot of people mistake the grave for that of Benjamin Franklin. It's not his, it's his parents' grave. Uh, he, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin was buried in Philadelphia. Um, but anyway, I remember my friend asking me about this locket and I said, oh, you know, it's so interesting. I told her where I bought it. Anyway, I, as I usually did, I went and I tried to research Clara Wilkinson. I did find a copy of her death certificate. So I, I learned that she died of tuberculosis consumption um, and that her father was a vicar in, in Wiltshire and a headmaster of a, a school. Um, so I found out, you know, some information. She was the eighth of nine children. Um, and then later, I tried tracing her mother's line. Her mother's name was Letitia Martha Shield was her maiden name. And when I did that, I was able to trace um, her back to the Franklins. And the relationship was through Sarah Franklin, who was Benjamin Franklin's sister. And I just thought, this is so amazing that I... I moved from Los Angeles. I had this piece. I was overlooking the burial ground where this girl pictured in my piece, her ancestors are buried. And <laughs> it's probably the coolest story I have of something I found out. I mean, also that it's, has, it's kind of distant because it was, you know, a number of generations back, the relationship of Clara, who died in 1867, to um, to Sarah Franklin, but nevertheless, it's there. And the fact that there I was wearing it and overlooking her ancestor's grave in Boston was kind of 
kind of cool, you know? Uh, so welcome. anyway. Welcome to the family history world where, the right. ser where serendipity plays a role. And sometimes you just have sure. these moments where you're like a few months ago, I was in a uh, cemetery looking to try to find where my ancestors were buried. And mm -hmm. I stopped because it was a huge cemetery and I was just sort of wandering around aimlessly. And all of a sudden I stopped and I stopped right next to the grave of someone I had included in one of my books. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, it happens. It does happen. You know, we, there's things we don't, you know, we're not privy to the workings of the entire universe. And I don't know, but that locket's very dear to me, first of all, because she died young. It's beautifully made. I love her photo. And then just, I don't know how it ended up with me, right, as I was moving back to where her ancestors came from, or at least on her mother's side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so are there things that you can tell us about mourning jewelry uh, and memorial pieces that, you know, what are some of the misunderstood things? The people that, you know, we, we think of like the hair jewelry, for instance, hair jewelry mm -hmm. is for most people associated with a, a dead person when in fact, that's not necessarily the case as you just explained, but are there other right. things about mourning jewelry that, that you can tell us about? Well, you know, the, I think the biggest misconception, and this was kind of what we wanted to address, um, when we did the exhibit with Matt, when I did the exhibit with Mass Historical, was that people had this view of it as a very morbid focus, you know, on death, and rather than thinking about how people at the time viewed it as um, tokens of love and respect and remembrance, um, it had nothing to do with a morbid sensibility. Death was. Um, usually took place in the home. Sick people were cared for in the home. Children died uh, very frequently. Um, infants did. Women died in childbirth. And so children were exposed to death all the time. Uh, they, they were aware of it. They would, you know, their friends would die. Their siblings might die. And so it was a way of connecting people to to those that they loved and lost. Um, so there was really nothing morbid about it, but we see it that way because death is, well, that's changing now, but I mean, death has been removed from the family and the home um, and sterilized and we don't talk about it. And um, that's not the way it was. So that was, I think the biggest misconception that we wanted to address. Um, what else? You know, well, also, too, because you see these, especially the earlier 18th century pieces, and you can see this, too, in cemetery iconography. New England's full of the graves with the skull and crossbones and the skeletons and, um, and the scythe and, you know, Halloween-ish type uh, iconography. It certainly wasn't. It was more, it was very christian kind of way of saying to people, live a good life because we all are going to die and, you know, you want to have a good afterlife and this is, we all will become bones. Uh, so you have to try to, I guess what I really understood was you have to view these things in the context in which they were made and what the beliefs were, and this changed too over time as we progress, and you can see that in the jewelry, you can see that in the cemetery iconography, but what the beliefs were, um, you know, prevalent in society at the time, and it may have nothing to do with the way we look at things now. Mm -hmm. Right? So, for example, in the later Victorian period, you have much softer iconography in cemeteries. We're all familiar with the angels and the draped urn and the weeping, you know, weeping widow, the weeping, sometimes even the dog, which symbolizes loyalty. Um, you know, you see less of 
the skulls and um, more of the less of the memento mori type symbolism than than one did earlier. Well, I have to say that I'm very disappointed in myself for missing this exhibit uh, at the Mass with Jesus. Shame on you. I know. It's only an hour from my house. (laughs) What was I thinking? I think I was moving that year, and I know Mm. I was moving that year, so things were a little up in the air. But I would have enjoyed seeing these pieces in person, but the photography in this book uh, are just, they're just gorgeous photographs of these pieces so that you can actually see in many cases, the, ins- the inscriptions in the rings mm-hmm. and in, right. in the lockets, which are just wonderful. So Sarah, right. it's been great talking with you today about morning jewelry and memorial pieces. And I look forward to catching one of your lectures at some point. I also sure. hope that you do another exhibit. I would love to, Maureen. I mean... It was a real labor of love. I, it was a lot of work, but I enjoyed it. I have a, a bigger collection now, you know, because I've still been collecting since 2012. And I would be honored to partner with a museum um, and do another exhibit. So, yeah, I, um, of course, I'll Great. certainly let you know. But, yeah, if you can come to one of my lectures, those are interesting, too. I do a lot of visuals, slideshow and so forth. So yeah. It's uh it's confession time, Sarah. <laughs> How many pieces <laughs> do you have? Oh, well, not as many as you might think. I mean, I have a lot, but um I would say how many pieces do I have? 125. Uh you know, I'm I'm not trying to catalog the entire history of morning jewelry. There is a gentleman in Australia who has a collection of, I don't know, six to 800 pieces. Mm -hmm. And he's really cataloging the whole history of it. I'm not doing that. It's more, um, I guess it's really, you know, I buy the pieces that speak to me. So a lot of times, and I, I know it's heavily weighed towards 18th century rather than 19th century pieces. I don't have many later Victorian pieces. So post-1840, 1850, I don't have that many. I feel like that's really when pieces were mass produced. And... um those are much more easily come by. There's nothing wrong with that. They're certainly historically important. It's just that they don't appeal to me as much. And I'm more interested in unusual pieces. Um, Unusual from the perspective of whether it be the materials and the construction or the style uh, or, you know, with a fascinating history and inscription to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking to you know, have a whole retrospective. Uh, but yeah, I, I have a fair amount. <laughs> well, we, we collect what we love, right? Right, that's true. Mm. Yes, and it is, it is what I love. I do love it. Well, thank you again for joining me on The Photo Detective. And I'll see you in town soon, I hope. Thank you very much, Maureen. I appreciate it. It's been a, a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media, leave me a rating and a review. And if you know of a friend or family member who's also interested in family photographs, share this episode with them too. See you next time.